from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Coming up today, K-State's Terry Griffin is joined by Texas A&M's Tiffany Lashmet. They'll talk about the new online aid they've created for you producers to use when determining the capital gains tax liability of a land sale, especially when the value of that land upon inheritance is unknown. They've come up with a way to calculate an estimate of the stepped-up basis for that property. Also, K-State's Brian Brigaman will offer his latest observations on the state of the macroeconomy and interest rate trends. That's the topic of his presentation at the upcoming Farming for the Future programs K-State will be hosting. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Dennis Patton walks through the basic steps of garden composting right here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. On this opening segment, we want to bring up a topic that is highly important to producers, to be sure, when it comes to tax management, known as stepped-up basis in regard to the value of agricultural property and the tax liabilities that are associated with that basis level. When it comes to, for example, land transactions, a new analysis out of K-State in cooperation with Texas A&M University allows producers to get a better handle on the stepped-up basis levels for that property. And we'll explain further here with our guests. Along with us once again is K-State Research and Extension agricultural economist Terry Griffin and an agricultural law specialist from Texas A&M, Tiffany Lashmet. They collaborated on this work, and Terry, we'll turn to you first of all and have you explain the absolute significance of understanding stepped-up basis. Well, this project came about, we were getting phone calls uh, from a lot of landowners, and they were asking the question of how can we get a just sort of a general idea of how much um, tax liability we'll have if we're going to sell land that we had inherited sometime in the past. And they're looking for at least a rough idea of this. So we came up with the idea that if we did not have information in the past about the appraised value of the farmland, but they knew what the value was today, let's say they got it appraised in 2017, then we could backwards calculate how much it was worth in the past and figure out how much would be a taxable amount. And so we uh, developed these tables for each state, or at least the lower 48 states, and uh, put this publication together. Mm-hmm. You know, and Tiffany and I have been working on other projects for the last few years, and you know, we, we came together not very long ago, a few weeks ago, and said, hey, let, let's put this together in a written document. Uh, let's do all the states, not just Kansas and Texas. Um, so we did all the states we had data for and uh, put this piece together. And it was uploaded what, December 1st. And it's out and available for anyone to utilize it. Tiffany, let's step back a bit, though, and explain how capital gains works in a very basic sense. A lot of folks are familiar with it. Uh, some might not be. But would you lend some uh, clarity to that? Absolutely. So a capital gains tax um, is just a tax that's levied basically on profits that someone makes when they sell a capital asset at a price higher than they bought it. So using land as an example, that's kind of the classic one in agriculture. Uh, If you bought property for, let's say, $100 an acre, and today maybe it's worth $1,000 an acre, uh, then your basis for your capital gains tax uh, would be $900 the 1000 today minus the 100 that you purchased it at. So you would owe um, a, the percentage of capital gains tax then on that $900. So that's real basically uh, kind of how the idea of capital gains tax works. Mm-hmm. And then you factor in, though, the step up in basis, which lends some relief in these circumstances, correct? Absolutely. Step up in basis is a huge benefit for agricultural landowners. So where that might come in, Let's say that your grandparents bought the farm, you know, a century ago, and they paid $100 an acre, and then maybe you inherited the farm, uh, let's just say 1950, and at that time it was worth $500 an acre. If you inherit the farm, you're allowed to take advantage of what's called stepped-up basis, 
And essentially what it does is your basis for capital gains tax gets to step up from that initial 100 to that 500. So basically the value of the land when you inherit it. And so that can make a big difference for your um, tax liability when we increase that basis to the value at inheritance. And trying to sort of get an idea of maybe what the land was worth at that time is exactly what Dr. Griffin was explaining that led us to uh, come up with these tables and hopefully help people do some analysis. So then to fill this void of uh, knowledge about what that basis might have been at the time the, the land was acquired via inheritance, you have developed this information, and it is quite exhaustive. We obviously can't roll through all those tables in, in great detail here today. But how, Terry, did you get at these numbers? I've been working on projects similar to this when I was in Illinois, uh, Arkansas, now in Kansas. And, and every August, um, USDA... NAS, National Ag Statistics Service, uh, releases information about, from survey-based information about farmland values. And in all three of those states, we put these, a table together. And the idea was if you knew the value of land at any point in history, going back to you know, 1950-ish, we could calculate the value for another year. And it's a roundabout estimate. It's not you know, exact. It's not an appraisal. But it gives us an idea. Now, the problem is each of those three states I've worked in, uh, the values change differently than the other states. Mm -hmm. And so what we did, we downloaded data from USDA for the 48 lower states. So each state has its own table. Like I said, the reason is the values change differently for each state. I'll give an example. And it's for Alabama. Alabama's alphabetically the first state. Mm -hmm. And they were randomly, randomly chose table 14. Happens to be Kansas. I'll give an example for Kansas. And then uh, randomly chose table 41, uh, which is Texas. Mm -hmm. This and is all in the document online. All three examples are spelled out in the document that's online. Very good. Let's share in as basic a sense as we can here, Tiffany, an example of, of how this information might be utilized by the individual as they try to identify what kind of a step up in basis they can rely upon before they pull the trigger on a land transaction, for instance. Sure. And again, when they can get those two numbers, the appraised value today minus the value of the property at inheritance, which would be the stepped-up basis. It's the difference between those numbers you multiply by the tax rate to kind of get the idea of your capital gains tax liability. So we actually walk folks through um, some examples in the fact sheet. One of those is Texas-specific. And in that example, if you assume that farmland was inherited in 2001, uh, and then the assumption is you have an appraisal done today, and the land appraises at $1,800 an acre. So the question is, what was the land value in 2001? And that's where the table can come into play. So if you go to table 41, which is the table for Texas, um, you can see the value, um, the indexed value for 2001 and 2017. And you take the value um, of that index, and so that's from the table, for 2001, Divide that number by the index value for 2017, and then you multiply that by the current dollar value per acre. So in this situation, it's 135.44 divided by 387.76, and then you multiply that by the 1,800 per acre, and that gives you the estimated farmland value in 2001 of $629. And so to determine the taxable value, then, of the uh, capital gains taxes on that property, you subtract the 1800 minus the 629 and that gives us 1171 And Tiffany, there really hasn't been anything comprehensive like this that uh, landowners, farmers, ranchers could lean on in the past, has there? No, that's exactly right. And there have been some extension publications put out um, talking about capital gains and discussing stepped-up basis. But nothing that let folks sort of look at numbers um, that are publicly available and try to ballpark uh, these amounts. And so our goal here really was to let people do some kind of some simple math using these tables and, and a tool that can be available for every state to allow them to figure out what that capital gains liability might be. Yeah. And one thing that's important to note, 
what we figure out here is the value on which um, the capital gains tax will be uh, calculated. Keep in mind that the percentage tax rate that folks pay, that depends on your tax bracket and some other factors. And mm-hmm. so this just gives you um, the amount from which you will calculate your actual tax bill. The math that you do here doesn't give you an idea of what that amount you pay will be. Right. A very important distinction there. And this is now available, Terry, on the agmanager.info website, correct? It is. It went up on December 1st. And it also will be available on uh, Tiffany's uh, blog post. And we're asking other universities to to uh, cross-post it to their websites as well because you know, it's not just a Kansas or a Texas. Um, you know, our neighbors listening in Nebraska and even Oklahoma um, will have information here as well, but you know, all 48 lower states are represented. On agmanager.info, you're looking for estimating tax liability using stepped-up basis. Click on that link. It'll take you right to the article accompanying all those tables. And, Tiffany, as Terry mentions, you have a blog spot that you're featuring this on as well. How might folks access that? That's right. Here in the next week or so, it's going to be posted on the Texas Agriculture Law blog. Uh, You can just Google Texas Agriculture Law blog. Or the other option, uh, the website is agrilife.org slash texasaglaw. We can't overstate the importance of this information and this tool that folks can use as they're entering critical decisions on selling agricultural land and the capital gains liabilities that might accrue to that transaction. Congratulations to the both of you for crunching through a a ton of numbers here to arrive at these helpful tables, and we do appreciate the time that you've spent with us today explaining what you've come up with. Thank you, Tiffany, for joining us. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And Terry, likewise. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Tiffany. Along with Terry Griffin, agricultural economist, K-State Research and Extension, Tiffany Lashmet, who's an agricultural law specialist at Texas A&M University, and they teamed up to create this handy tool for figuring out what the likely capital gains tax liability might be in a ballpark sense using stepped-up basis figures. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and welcome back. We're just a few days away now from the first of those four keynote meetings that K-State Agricultural Economics will be hosting in the coming weeks called Farming for the Future. These are sweeping programs which cover a number of important topics regarding the agricultural economy and how you farmers and ranchers can wade your way through these current challenging times. One of the sessions within this program will get right at the state of the macro economy, how it's relating to the agricultural economy and the likely trend in interest rates. And presenting that information is our guest now. He is Brian Brigham. Director of the Arthur Capper Cooperative Center here at Kansas State University. And, Brian, first off, these sessions are going to be tremendous, and we want to encourage people to take them in. Yes, it's uh, an important time for farmers to come and get some good information about how to lead their farming operations into the future, because obviously net farm incomes are down, things are a bit tight. So, you know, it's good to come in for a discussion about where input costs are going, grain markets, uh, how's the livestock market, developing different government programs, and then, of course, the session that I'll be talking about on interest rates. So it's an opportunity to help farmers think through some of the challenges that they are facing. And we will run through the wins and wares of these meetings a little later on here. But you are asked to address the macro economy in these sessions. The perception is that the overall economy is doing well, even as agriculture's economy is struggling a bit. What's your general take there? So as we look at the macro economy, the U.S. economy as a whole, uh, things look to be actually doing okay. Not great, not 
bad, but just about okay. The recent uh, results from GDP or gross domestic product growth, the way we measure how well our economy is doing, uh, that came in for the third quarter of 2017. We're at 3.3%, which is pretty strong. We look at numbers that get up over three that we really see, you know, the economy is building some steam and doing okay. Now, before that, the rest of this year, we've been hovering right around two or so, which is kind of just moving along. So the end of the year looks to be doing all right. Now, why that is coming through is, you know, we're a nation of consumers, right? Consumption is what drives the U.S. economy. And so when we look at how the consumer is doing, that really kind of gives us an indication of, you know, the GDP results. And as we look at the consumer, unemployment rate sets at 4.1 percent. So it's quite low. It's been low for some time. Uh, we're starting to see some people come back and are more interested in engaging and looking for employment. And a big piece of that is that actually if you look at salary and wage data on an inflation-adjusted basis, we're actually seeing it to start to come up. Not a great deal, but begin to tick up. And that's important because especially coming off of the the big recession, the great recession we had in 2008, 2009, those salary, real salary wages were actually trending down slightly, if not holding flat. So our spending power wasn't improving. Um, we didn't have more disposable income to go out and spend and buy things. So that, you know, is starting to edge up, which is good for the economy and is starting to pull it up. So as I look, you know, for fourth quarter estimates, yeah, it looks like the fourth quarter is going to be quite good and strong. So hopefully uh, we can continue this momentum going forward. And just your general outlook, will that momentum continue in a steady, maybe slow, but steady and positive direction? Yeah, I feel that it will. Um, There's enough uh, solid things going on within the economy, like I said, about the consumer is improving. Will it be the robust growth that everybody really wants and and would you know likely expect coming off of a recession i don't think so we've transitioned as an economy you know back when you look at the 80s even the early 90s we were primarily manufacturing based and had a lot of manufacturing jobs and we built stuff we've moved more into a service type economy and it's kind of new uncharted territory for us so to expect like that huge robust growth could it happen sure I don't think it's my expectation. In fact, I think a lot of it is just due to coming off of a really tremendous financial crisis. Mm -hmm. It just takes time for things to heal. And that's, if you look back over history, other economies around the world that have experienced a financial crisis. Now, granted, not to the magnitude of what we had, but, you know, similarly traumatic, uh, you know, usually it takes about 10 years or so to really kind of pull out of that. So if we look that it ended in 2009, you know, we're right about year eight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I think it's going to be continued slow, steady growth coming out. The economy is healing. The other part of your presentation at the Farming for the Future sessions, Brian, will get right at uh, an important matter of interest to every agricultural producer out there. Where are interest rates headed? (laughs) And what are the tea leaves saying to you? Boy, I tell you, Eric, that's a a question that I have struggled with, have been asked for many years. Yeah, wondering, well, you know, we were at the zero bound, right, for many years, really, and quarters just setting and months setting there at that zero bound and interest rates were incredibly low. Now, they have edged up, you know, with the improving economy. Things have improved. So the Fed has raised interest rates slow, but it's been slow and steady. So if we look into the future and to say where are interest rates going, of course, here in December, the Fed will meet and have an announcement. And many within the marketplace is expecting the Fed to raise interest rates slightly. And I think that's the key part when you talk about interest rates in the future. Related to, you know, the U.S. economy improving, you know, the Fed will likely start to raise interest rates, right? The Fed does that to help temper growth because we don't want to grow too quickly, create some sort of inflation problem. Mm -hmm. So the way that you combat that is you let interest rates rise. But, you know, I don't foresee the Fed raising interest rates sharply to a point that we would really feel it within agriculture. I think they've prepared the market to raise them slow and steady, and that's the path they're going to continue. Some of the stuff that I'll talk about in the Farming for the Future workshop will be to look out even further to say, 
all right, you know, five years from now, how might interest rates look? And to give a bit of a preview, one of the things that if you track the Fed's announcements, they do release some projections. And one of the things that you see is that they are projecting lower interest rates across the board in the long term. So what does that mean for us in ag? When I go out and talk and build this argument, which I don't have a ton of time right here, but is to say prepare for a lower interest rate environment for a while. Not not the zero bound environment. Let's hope we don't go back to that. But, you know, it's going to be a slow and steady rise. So when we look at like what producers pay on interest rates at loans, on variable interest rates, even fixed rates, yeah, they might come up a little bit, but I wouldn't expect any sort of sharp increase for what producers would actually pay to their lender. Now, there is a, a variable that's worthy of consideration here, and that is that there will be a new Federal Reserve chair at some point. The nominee is out there. Mm-hmm. And what does that bring to the table in regard to the interest rate outlook? So when you think about the interest rate outlook, you have to look at, well, What's the Fed doing? What are they saying? And more importantly, who's the chair? Because that gives you a lot of indication because that individual has a lot of influence over the Federal Open Market Committee, the committee that gets together to set interest rates. Well, the new chairperson that President Trump has put forward and and this individual is going through confirmation right now is Jerome Powell. He's a Wall Street exec who came from business, was appointed by President Obama in 2012 to serve as a Fed governor. Um, So he has experience with the Fed. He has experience with business. He has experience with the macro economy. So very well qualified to serve as chair. He's widely known within Washington, D.C. as a consensus builder, as somebody who wants to have open discussion and will listen to both sides. So at least from the reports that I've been reading, those are good things at the Fed because there are differing viewpoints about where the economy is going and we need to have that open discussion. Um, so where, you know, Powell takes us going forward, I, I would expect, you know, that slow, steady rise in interest rates. I think he's going to lean more that way. So, you know, a lot of the stuff where the market is prepared for that, that's what I expect Powell to do going forward. Well, you will be availing yourself to discuss all of these matters with those producers who will attend these sessions that K-State is putting on. You're looking forward to that dialogue, right? Yeah, I always enjoy getting out and and speaking with farmers and and other individuals who want to come to these Farming for the Future workshops just to have an open discussion and to help farmers think through positioning their operations for success in the future um, that I I feel that this workshop can help – them with. So I hope to see a lot of folks come out. Uh, It should be a good discussion. We got a great lineup of speakers uh, and it should be a great day. Brian, thanks for sharing a preview of what you'll be sharing in full at each of these sessions and we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Eric. He's the director of the Arthur Capper Cooperative Center in the Department of Agricultural Economics here at K-State. Brian Brigham on the program for the Farming for the Future sessions taking place at four locations around Kansas, starting next week with the first and the others to follow. Next Thursday, the 14th, that's a week from today, in Pratt. Tuesday, the 19th of December in Salina, Wednesday, January the 10th in Scott City, and Thursday, January the 11th in Emporia. They're asking you to register no later than five days ahead of each of these, and to do so, simply contact the extension offices in the host counties, those being Pratt, Saline, Scott, and Lyon counties. And we'll be back after these moments away. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Again, glad to have you along with us. Eric Atkinson here, turning now to today's agricultural news page and these headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, yesterday, U.S. Senator Jerry Moran from Kansas met with Secretary of Commerce Wilbur Ross regarding the ongoing negotiations with the North American Free Trade Agreement and NAFTA's vital importance to farmers, ranchers, and manufacturers in Kansas. Moran requested the meeting through the Senate Commerce Committee in a letter to Commerce Chairman John Thune. He was joined by several of his colleagues from that committee. The senator said that the economy in Kansas is dependent on the ability ability of farmers, ranchers, and manufacturers to trade their products. He told Secretary Ross to be extremely mindful in his words of the role agriculture trade plays in Kansas economy and the consequences of NAFTA withdrawal to Kansas farmers and ranchers. To illustrate the point, he showed the secretary a picture of the grain piles waiting on the ground near Kensington in north central Kansas as a direct example of why NAFTA is needed in this state to sell goods and to feed the world as the senator put it. He said he would appreciate the secretary's willingness to engage in this issue and hear the concerns. He said that Secretary Ross understands that he, Senator Moran, will continue to follow the negotiation process closely and that the senator will not hesitate to bring up further concerns as he hears from farmers and ranchers on the issue. Meantime, Senator Joni Ernst of Iowa followed up on expectations that she would raise the the importance of NAFTA as she and other lawmakers met with the president and U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer at the White House this week. She reiterated to the administration the importance of ensuring that agriculture can remain competitive in the global market. She said she will continue working to ensure that any changes made to NAFTA do not hurt crop and livestock producers. Ernst was among six Republicans Republicans who lunched with the president and other administration officials at the White House where they talked trade, taxes, and other issues. And a meeting with President Trump, several cabinet members, and Senator Ted Cruz of Texas on biofuels today will not involve Senator Chuck Grassley of Iowa. Grassley said, though he's not worried so long as the president keeps doing what he told the voters of Iowa, which is supporting ethanol, said Grassley. He said such meetings are not unusual and noted the session is probably not as key as it could have been now that the Environmental Protection Agency has announced its renewable fuel standard levels. As for the hold that Cruz placed on the nomination of Iowa Agriculture Secretary Bill Northey to a key USDA undersecretary post, Grassley said he did not think that the president would agree to weaken the RFS in exchange for Cruz to drop that hold. Meanwhile, some reports indicate an oil industry representative will attend the meeting. That has not been confirmed by the White House. Besides the president and Cruz, the meeting will also include EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt, USDA Secretary Senator Perdue, White House advisors, Energy Secretary Rick Perry, and National Economic Council Director Gary Cohn. U.S. agricultural exports for fiscal year 2018 are off to a good start, according to the latest USDA numbers. Here's more from the USDA's Gary Crawford. We have the ag trade numbers now for October, the opening month of this new fiscal year. And as far as exports go, they are opening the year with a bang. Agriculture Department trade analyst Bryce Cook. Yes. You saw a big jump between September and October. September's exports to end the 2017 fiscal year, $10.6 billion. October, 13.2. But that figure is about a billion dollars less than October 2016 when grain sales were unusually high. USDA's early forecast for total fiscal year 2018 exports, $140 billion, half a billion less than 2017. But Bryce says at this early point, it's really hard to know for sure how the year will go. Short term, though. I would simply expect that that November and December would also be pretty large totals. They traditionally are. But anything can happen, and we'll see. In Washington, Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And you're tuned in to Agriculture Today. We're around to time once again for the weekly feature called the Kansas Soybean Update. And presenting that, as always, is Greg Akagi. Greg? Doug Bounds, Kansas State Statistician for USDA's National Ag Statistics Service, joins us. And, Doug, producers will soon be seeing in their mail the 2017 Census of Agriculture. Why is this so important for producers to fill out? 
Well, Greg, the Census of Agriculture is important because it is a complete count of all U.S. farms and ranches and the people that operate them. It's only taken once every five years, and it looks at things like land use and ownership, operator demographics, production practices, income, and expenses. And in many cases gives that farmers a voice as far as the information that they need to fill out on this form, too. That's correct. The Census of Agriculture provides the only source of uniform comprehensive and impartial ag data for every county in the nation. Now, this is not only done via the mail, if they want to do it that way, but they can also fill this out on a secure website? That is correct. We have an improved online questionnaire this time around that makes responding much easier than ever before. And as always, responses will be secure and confidential as required by federal law. And what's that website they can go to? www.agcensus.usda.gov. And Doug, with the 2017 Census of Agriculture, this has future effects too, and that includes the upcoming debate on the Farm Bill. That is correct. Results from the census will be looked at by those in positions to make decisions, um, including the Farm Bill and other decisions that may be made at not just the federal, but state and county level. As you mentioned earlier, this can be done via the mail or via a secure website. What is the deadline they need to get that back in? We ask producers to have their forms returned to us by February 5th. So if they want more information, they can go to the website or they can call uh, the state statistician's office or can they contact someone in the county? They can contact me directly at 785-260-1508 or they can call the Agricultural Statistics Hotline at 1-800-727-9540. And they should be seeing that very soon in their mailbox, the 2017 Census of Agriculture, or as Doug mentioned, on the secure website as well. Doug, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. That is Doug Bounds, Kansas State Statistician for USDA's National Ag Statistics Service on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks as always, Greg. Quickly reminding you that Agriculture Today is now available in podcast form. Every weekday's program can be accessed that way. You can subscribe to that podcast by going to ksre.ksu.edu slash news. Click on the radio network tab there, then the Agriculture Today link. ksre.ksu.edu slash news. This is Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. This Agriculture Today concludes with our weekly K-State horticulture segment. And yes, we are now very much edging into the winter season. However, if you still have an interest as a home gardener in establishing a compost pile, you can get that started yet, even at this late date. And we'll talk about the uh, steps to follow. Dennis Patton has been good enough to join us once again via phone from his office in Olathe, where he is the Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Johnson County. There is, you say, Dennis, still the opportunity at hand if one wants to compost. That's correct. Uh, fall heading into winter is a great time to start a compost bin because we have a lot of materials. Uh, mainly leaves have come down and collecting around the, the landscape in the home. And then also we do some of our garden cleanup in the fall. And all that dry garden debris leaves make an excellent material to start building the base of a great compost bin. Those are the the essentials, of course, organic material. But there are other ingredients, if you will, to a good compost, you say. That's correct. Um, what we're having now is mostly what we call the browns or the dry materials. 
And that's the carbon source into a compost bin. But to really make that bin function, we also need what we refer to as greens, something that brings nitrogen into the system itself. And unfortunately, this time of year, we don't have a lot of green material, like grass clippings is a very common one. But there's a very simple way to overcome that lack of nitrogen to get those carbon materials, the dry brown materials, stimulated and starting to break down. And that's through just adding a little bit of garden fertilizer to the compost bin. Because what we're really doing in composting is feeding microorganisms that break down or feed on the organic waste and turn it into compost. And so it's that proper ratio of the carbon and the nitrogen are the greens and the browns that make the compost process go. So how much fertilizer would one need to get the process rolling here? Oh, Eric, that is a really wonderful question. Because of being an extension agent, I should give you this really exact formula of add X amount. But I'm going to tell you, after every few bags of leaves, just throw a handful in there. You know, uh, it's not rocket science. It's just fun of gardening and turning that organic matter into something useful. And it'll all work out. If you overdo it, it'll slowly balance itself. If you underdo it, you're just not going to really probably jumpstart the pile. But you do want to layer that that green material, so to say, in the form of fertilizer with the organic material, right? That's correct. So you kind of have that carbon-nitrogen, green-brown ratio from top to bottom. And there's one other very important element that we're forgetting to discuss about composting, too, which is the other important thing that makes the compost process happen. It's not just feeding the microorganisms, but it's also, think about what we as human beings need. We need food oxygen, and of course we need water. Mm -hmm. And so we're putting a lot of dry brown materials into our compost bin, and so we also need to add water or water it because these microorganisms are alive, and it takes that combination of the greens and then the moisture of the water to really get them active and chomping down on those old brown leaves. And you want moisture to be present throughout the compost pile, so one should check the center of the pile every now and again to make sure it's somewhat moist, you say? Yeah, what I would probably do if we're building a pile would maybe have a hose with a shutoff valve uh, right next to you so you can add a little bit of leaves, throw in the fertilizer, wet it down, and repeat repeat, repeat till you fill the bin. And that way you've got moisture at the start from top to bottom, inside to out, and you're going to really get the best, what I call rapid or jumpstart that compost bin. There's merit as well in a step called turning compost. You might explain that, Dennis. Right. Uh, So once you build the bin and then those microbes start to feed, it's going to actually heat up. Uh, Actually, a a well-maintained or built compost bin could heat up to as much as 150, 170 degrees. So if you plunge your hand into that or put a a fork in there and leave it for a while, it's going to be hot to the touch. And we turn it then once that temperature falls to redistribute those materials and get that bin to heat up and also to kind of uh, help compost everything, just not the internal part of the bin itself. So how often to turn? You just uh, go by feel again, in, in essence? Well, you know, if you're really into composting, and Joke and I say there's, there's two types of composters. There's active or there's passive or there's fast or there's slow. And if you tend to be more active, more fast, then you're going to monitor the temperature, kind of know when that's cooling down, when it's time to add water, when it's time to turn it again, maybe throw in a little bit more fertilizer. If you tend to be more on the passive, the slow side, you know, you just may walk away and forget it because this is a natural process. And it's going to compost regardless of what we do. The question is, do you want compost maybe in six months or less, or do you want compost maybe in a year or more? Mm -hmm. Because it all happens, it's just how much you want to input into managing that pile. That's one of the things I love about composting. (laughs) It gets back to how fast you want that batch done. So, and you've interacted with gardeners many a year and talked composting with them. Are there yet some common errors, if you will, in composting? You know, the the two biggest, I'm going to use the word fails, uh, would be for people that really want active 
fast, hot composting is the two things we mentioned. They don't put enough greens in it, so they don't have that, that fertilizer. And then probably where most people have issues is on that amount of water. It, it's just the bin's very dry, and that just stops the process. Really, uh, an actively working pile probably almost needs to be the dampness of a, of a wet sponge. Uh, so we're talking about pretty good moisture to really make this work. So when we have rains, that's great. But if we go months without rains, like now here in the fall, Kansas is experiencing, that pile is just going to probably set there unless you put a little water on it. So uh, tend to that, for it has been dry for quite some time throughout most right. of Kansas. Of course, there is extension information on composting for gardening purposes, which you can find on online or through your local extension office. So check all of that out. Once more, there's still this window of opportunity to start a compost pile and then maintain it into and through the winter heading into next spring. Dennis, we appreciate the tips on this. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Dennis Patton is the Research and Extension Horticulture Agent in Johnson County, Northeast Kansas, and that is this week's K-State Horticulture segment. Rounding out our Thursday edition, And again, thanks for being along with us. We'll be right back here the same time tomorrow. Hope you'll rejoin us then. In the meantime, Eric Atkinson here, bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.